so our next panel, we're, we're so lucky in this industry to have um, a, a, a great selection of really brilliant attorneys. One of my, one of my little kind of you know, crosses is, you know, sometimes clients will say, well, my Uncle Morty is like a tax attorney. Can I just use him, you know, to write the contract? No, please don't do that. Unless you're going to let him do your open heart surgery, then go ahead. Um, so this next panel is a panel of, of a few more attorneys that we haven't heard from yet. And the moderator is Diane Hinson. She is the founder, owner, founder, and managing attorney of Creative Family Connections, which is an international assisted reproductive technology firm. And she, I'll let her introduce her panel. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, morning, afternoon, we're just sort of on the cusp here. Uh, so yes, I'm Diane Henson of Creative Family Connections. We are a law firm that pretty much does everything an agency also does. So we're an integrated firm. And our topic today is legal parentage after surrogacy. What does that mean? So, so we've been talking a lot about this journey to get the baby. And now what our panel is going to talk about is, okay, so now you've got your baby. Um, we're going to assume we get to that point. Um, what additional steps need to be taken after the baby is born by surrogacy to protect your rights as parents? Um, and, it, and it actually, you think, whoa, I'm there, right? Because we talked about a pre-birth order, or maybe in Steve's state, we're going to get that order right afterwards. But we got that order, it declares us as the parents. Well, maybe that's enough, but maybe not. Because if you go abroad, as we heard about, like Stacy said, go to the embassy, that was really fantastic advice. Or if you're coming from Germany or somewhere else, then you're going to have to go back home, get your child registered as a citizenship. Or even if you're from the U.S., if you are not just a married heterosexual couple, then there may be other steps you need to take. So what we're going to talk about today is what other things need to be done. So, Steve Snyder is our first speaker. As you already heard earlier today, he's from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he has an assisted reproductive law practice and also um, an agency. And so, Steve, can you please start us off today and talk about why, if, um, if parents are domestic couple, either a same-sex couple or... Um, you could be, I guess, a non, uh, you could be a hetero couple, but um, non-married, using an egg donor. Um, why does the non-bio parent, in this case, need to do something more? Um, what do you need to do, and why do you need to do it? Oh, you want my spot? No. Oh, no, you're wrong. You're going to walk. <laughs> you're going to walk. I forgot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. it's you and not me. <laughs> Alright, so Yeah, I have a I question, Steve. No, I have a quick people. I have a question, Steve. Okay. So Where you've got I don't know. So you've got a parentage order, right? And it's got you and it says that we declare these two men to be the parents and you've got a birth certificate. But the attorney says, well, really, you should also do a second parent adoption. Can you explain why this is not just an attorney saying, I think I want to make some more money? All right, at the risk of, of preempting, a, I'll answer that question. Not, right, nothing to do with marriage, just answer why you would also, why does that give more protection to also do, why would, why would someone suggest that besides? In two minutes or less. Fifteen seconds or less? Two minutes. <laughs> right. Uh, right. So, okay. So I get to let, we're going to bump it now over to Michelle. And um, because full faith and credit is actually a constitutional uh, concept. And I, what I want Michelle to do, Michelle, just so you all know, is um, give you a little background on Michelle, who, who, practices right here in the D.C. area as 
with me. She, her office is in Silver Spring, Maryland. She's the founding partner of Junker Law Group. And in addition to assisted reproduction, Mattel practices in the areas of adoption, LGBT issues, and numerous other family law issues. And Michelle, a long time, consider her a friend. And so we're very happy she's here today. Um, so what I'd like Michelle to do is answer the question of, of um, does it matter if the couple is married? We're talking, remember, in this case about a same-sex couple. How does it affect the analysis? And as we see our states falling, yay, one by one, and accepting, or either because they have to or because they should want to, whatever, that same-sex marriage is legal. Um, she can talk about how many there are now that either accept gay marriage and allow it or, or recognize it. Um, you know, how does that, what impact does that have on this analysis? What happens in the states where it isn't the case? Um, but why is it that an adoption order gets more oomph than a parentage order since the full faith credit, just to give you a nugget of constitutional law here, under the Constitution, any final judgment should get full faith and credit in another state. So, you know, all of us who understand that are like, well, why isn't a parentage order good enough? So, with all that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. And to think of it in terms of your child. So, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop you at that point. But, right. Thinking of it not just in terms of yourself, but in terms of your child um, can help at that point. So, thank you, Michelle. Um, okay. So now we're going to turn to Lori Myers. Lori uh, came to us all the way today from California, from Sherman Oaks, and, um, right outside Los Angeles. She is the founding partner of Myers & O'Hara, a law firm um, that focuses exclusively on surrogacy and egg donor matters. So Lori, if you could now answer the question for us, um, what impact does this whole discussion have if the uh, parents come from um, overseas. So we had some, um, client, some prospective parents back here from Germany, some one from India. So um, you, let's say they come here and they have their baby, um, they get the pre-birth or post-birth order that says, yes, you're the parent, get a birth certificate. How does that impact the analysis as to the post-birth steps and what, what's needed? Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to sit here if that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be here today. It's true that the world of marriage equality and family formation for traditional and non-traditional families has absolutely exploded. I've been in this industry for 20 years and with the advent of really excellent medical technology has become this world of possibility for families of all types and that's really exciting for all of us as professionals. Um, and in the legal world, it's very collaborative. These are my colleagues and we work together. By definition, there's always two attorneys um, on both sides of the, the case. There's someone representing the intended parents and there's someone representing the surrogate. And when you have professionals that are truly seasoned, there's a reliance on their professionalism in knowing what's going on on those consultations and so having Auntie Sue or your best friend who's a corporate lawyer to save you a thousand dollars doesn't do you a lot of good if there isn't someone who's really vetting the contract with the individual who's going to have your child that you can rely on. Um, I always say that the legal contract serves as a bit of a checklist of all the really important things to consider and with respect to international couples there are often these really unique requirements that will come at the end that if they show up in black and white at the beginning people at least have some expectation that there's going to be a, a phase later. We've, we've talked a lot about the seeds that go into this and, and how the education and this information is so much power and how wonderful that you can look around this room and think, wow, these are all the experts and people that could really make my baby happen and they're right here. But it's not just selecting those individuals and forming that team that everyone is echoing but also really seeing it through to the very end and knowing how all of those individuals will interface. Um, we've talked a bit already today about the uh, obtaining the pre-birth order. I'm here from California. 
Um, California has long been one of the leaders with respect to reproductive rights. I can get two men or two women placed on a birth certificate. That's been true for many years. Um, but what I'm finding in the um, growth of my international practice is it's not good enough simply to say how fantastic it is that I can get two names on a birth certificate. That is not dispositive of the rest of the journey. Um, there are really important issues with respect to citizenship back home for international couples, as well as simply travel documentation. What will it take to even get home? And fundamentally, I would just throw out to you, don't assume. Don't assume anything. Um, don't assume because you've got a great lawyer that that lawyer knows when to start the process to finalize your parental rights. Don't assume that the agency you've selected because they found you a fabulous surrogate is going to tell the attorney halfway through the process to send you the information and get that phase started. Typically, I would only have a client retain me for the contract phase and not start the process or collect any fees for finalization until after the first trimester, halfway through. And so that communication needs to be ongoing so that we know when to start. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have clients that came to me Oh, I'm here in the United States, my baby's born. You said you could get my name on the birth certificate, no problem. Well, it takes about at least a month start to finish from the moment you say let's get a judgment until the moment you have it. And international clients in particular are very anxious to get home. They're here at great expense and inconvenience. And it's really important that we work together to make sure that those timelines are expedited. In California, I can get an expedited birth certificate usually within five business days. And over the years, and granted this has been about a 20 year span, typically for international clients, we've advised that because the child is born a US citizen, the goal is to obtain an expedited birth certificate and immediately apply for a US passport as the best and fastest way to get that child home. And a US passport can be expedited in a couple of days. Well, again, that's great, but it's not the end of the journey. It's a bit of the end of my journey in years past, but what I have found is that we've gotten smarter and better at assisting clients, not just in having a baby, but in completing the process to travel home and for citizenship. And that's a very complicated question. And we've talked again a lot today about talking to the right people. Um, with respect to Germany, very unique country. Um, there's a woman named Mandy Pescher for the German couple out there. If you haven't spoken to her, she's excellent. Um, you know, she can help determine whether you need a surrogate who's a single surrogate, an unmarried surrogate. That becomes an important issue for international couples sometimes. Um, you know, with respect to Australia, Sam's talked today about the cloud and the confusion and the changes with respect to the law in Australia about surrogacy in general. And at the same time, there have been some changes because of immigration and children coming into the country to the immigration and citizenship provisions on um, how you can establish a child as a citizen by descent. And it used to be that strictly it had to be uh, that one of the parents was an Australian citizen and that DNA test was required by blood. And now because of some of the changes internationally and children that have been stateless, perhaps that's changed. But marry that against the confusion and the cloud, so to speak, of surrogacy law in Australia, that becomes very complicated. Um, my practice has also expanded to China and Italy, particularly for same-sex couples. Well, that's again thrilling that I can go to these countries and tell these men or women that I can get both of their names on the birth certificate, but that really doesn't help them in terms of establishing citizenship for them back home. Only the biological father can appear on that birth certificate. And in California, we can then amend the birth certificate afterwards to reflect both names so that hopefully the world and the law will catch up with ourselves as we go through these changes. And eventually, hopefully worldwide, both parents will be recognized. And that's something that the amended birth certificate can be utilized. But currently, I've been having only the biological father appear on the birth certificate and obtain the citizenship to go home. That raises a few other complications with respect to things like insurance. That means that the biological father who's on the original birth certificate had better be the one who is either enrolled or has some sort of benefits for the child. If it is a non-biological partner who does not appear on the, 
the original birth certificate, that will create some issues with respect to insurance and benefits. Um, the other comment I would make is, you know, for international couples, sometimes it's very hard. You know, we're saying, okay, we're here in the U.S., we can make all this happen and then be sure and, you know, confer with these other lawyers. Andy Pescher is someone I know in, in Germany. That's fantastic. But in China and Italy, places that have long, you know, prohibited surrogacy, it's going to be very difficult to find attorneys to be open and discuss these things in, in a public way with citizens in a home country. And as a result of that, there is a sense that they, people don't want to talk to the local government officials and they kind of take their chances uh, once they get here and bring what they believe is the best documentation possible to the embassies to get their travel documentation and citizenship going home. Um, I was amazed when a prominent um, single father uh, was trying to get documentation to go home to China and walked into the Chinese embassy with all the paperwork he believed he had in place. The paperwork sat in the embassy for a week and a half. They called him back in. They gave it back and said, we don't get it. It's odd. We don't recognize surrogacy. No. And he, this is an example of a client who is then stuck. And so there's whims based on embassy um, locations, embassy individuals, their experience. Um, that individual, again, I was so shocked in San Francisco, how could that be? I had experience in Los Angeles where I'm located. I brought the client back to Los Angeles. <laughs> it went through very smoothly, but he needed DNA testing. I mean, I knew to tell him this, but he had to have DNA testing. He needed his identification card from China. I've had clients come here without those documents, thinking that, oh, I've got my passport. I don't need the local uh, identification documents because I'm doing everything here. I'll deal with that when I get home. And to a certain degree, I think that's been a sense of the advisement of some professionals along the way. Let us do everything, we'll get your baby home, and then you take care of everything there. When really there are some important pieces of documentation, sometimes marriage certificates, proof of single status, a copy of your ID card, DNA evidence, those kinds of things that you need to have with you in order for everything to go smoothly. Thank so, you, Lori. Yeah. That's great. Um, and, and it's actually very analogous, I think, to in the U.S., where, as Michelle was saying, even in state, a lot of the states in this country um, where it's based on case law, it's really court by court, judge by judge. So you wander into the wrong court, it, it's, it could be a disastrous result. So if um, I could just say one last thing, work backwards get all this information and then work backwards so that you know what you are going to need here and then have the contract and everything else reflect that. As lawyers, we're usually the last people that you meet on that chain and yet the most important information goes in our contract. So there's sometimes a big rush and if we can know what those pieces are at the outset, it's helpful. So let me ask a question and Michelle or Steve, maybe you can answer because you raised this, Lori. Um, we probably have time for mm -hmm. one question unless I see any out there. But um, so you mentioned that if the baby's born to, and one of the biological parents is the is the one of the dads is the bio parent, it may be an issue with insurance. But is that your experience, or in the U.S., um, does it matter which bio dad is the which dad is the bio dad for purposes of um, the newborn insurance if you're here in the U.S., while you're here in the U.S., as long as one of them has insurance. Does either one of you want to tackle that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a number of speakers earlier had said insurance now in the United States is incredibly complicated. And so it's not just the bio dad, but who's the surrogate? You know, is the surrogate, is the birth going to be covered? Is the post, um, post birth, uh, postnatal care going to be covered. So yes, it's right. very important. But, you know, but assuming the, that one of the dads has insurance, right. whether it's domestic or not, that's does gonna, it matter if it's their biological child? Yes, yes, absolutely it matters because that legal relationship, remember, is created in our, in our society. It is still created by biology. So let's say they're married and there's a presumption it's still going to be that bio dad. But obviously, he does not have a relationship with the carrier. So the other issue is, does the carrier have the appropriate insurance? Um, and, and really, I think in surrogacy, that has 
is uh, becoming the number one issue. So I'll just take on to what Michelle said. The insurance coverage is going to be determined by the insurance contract. The insurance contract will contain a definition of eligible dependents. Depending on what the eligible dependency definition is, it may or may not apply. So somebody needs to read that in advance before you start the process to know what it's going to look like at the end, taking on to what Lori said, start at the end and work forward. Some insurance policies say spouse, <laughs> domestic partner, and either party's children. Some only refer to your biological or stepchildren, which presumes a marriage relationship. So the bottom line is, read the documents. <clears throat> the documents are all going to be different, and that affects coverage. So yeah, one more thing about that. If there's going to be a second parent adoption, and for the postnatal care for the child, uh, under federal law, that child is eligible for insurance through the adoptive parent as of birth. That's, so that's another that's piece. That's what I was looking yeah, for, right. That's, a, that's right. another piece that, that, that comes that, into this. Right. That's another mm -hmm. advantage of a plan to adopt, that right. you then, mm -hmm. then you, it doesn't matter as much. you don't get with much. the pre-birth order or right. post-birth order. Right. right. So then it does, then the, the biological link doesn't matter as much. So, well, I think what, just to sum this all up, if you think, let's go back a second for, to the metaphor that Kim <clears> gave earlier which is that this is a marathon, not a, not a sprint. If you think about it, if you've ever watched the Boston Marathon on television, they don't stop right when they get to the line. They keep going. And it's the same thing here. You don't just stop when you have your baby. There are other steps that need to be taken to preserve your legal rights as a parent and the rights of your child. And I think these are some of them that we've talked about today. So can thank you. Can I just say one thing about international couples? The insurance issue that we just talked about does not apply to them. So yeah. they're in a totally <clears throat> different situation about insurance and much more dependent on what that carrier has as insurance or insurance policy they buy that costs many, many, many thousands of dollars. And that's a whole other yeah. topic by itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah.